Uh, I'm honoured to speak with you today because I and my colleagues at NAUS recognise and admire the enormous contribution the community sector makes uh, across Australia and, of course, here in Queensland to the wellbeing of so many Australians, our communities and our nation. So, um, in making the observations I'm going to make, please put them in the context of um, an enormous admiration for the work. And, of course, you immediately say he's going to say some things that might con disconcert me or worry me as well as inspire me, and that's probably true. And I think, as Karen said, and I listened with great interest, as Karen said, this sector has always been subject to change. It's, it's never been different, and it's absolutely the case that um, there is probably more change coming, some of which I think you should absolutely welcome, and some of which you might say, this is going to cause some pressures for us that we will um, be challenged to respond to. Uh, the perspectives I'm sharing are based on 15 years of working closely with community sector providers across Australia, um, government, particularly agencies in government that, are, that work with you, um, and private sector businesses across Australia as well. And so as an example, in the last year we've worked with around 50 community sector organised organisations in six states and territories on large projects and small projects. Now, um, speeches, as with songs, like to have titles, and so I'd like to offer you this one today, which I'm going to call my speech, Will You Be Bold? And as I talk through, um, if, you, if you're on a board of a uh, community sector organisation or you're in the management team or you're one of the service providers, I'd ask you to keep thinking to yourself, are we bold? Will we be bold enough? Will we be able to respond to these challenges? Um, and there are many ways into this topic, but let me perhaps start with the big picture. And the big picture, I think, has six dimensions to it. The first is there is absolutely a consumer revolution going on and probably started not in consume the community sector, but in other sectors 20 or 25 years ago. Um, it's the community sector now, and in fact, some of you might say has been here for some time, but if you look at um, the community sector, disabled Australians and carers are asking for, indeed demanding, greater control over the service options that are off being offered to them. And in a sense, that's part of the approach to disability care. Um, a elderly Australians have increasingly been choosing care in their home and a whole mix of other services that they require. Um, in health, and it's not just in the community sector, in health, there's increasingly a theme called con consumer-centred care, where the expertise of the clinicians and the providers is, is being seen as one part of the puzzle for a successful health outcome, and the needs and requirements and interests of consumers is being part, seen as another part of the puzzle. Uh, it's also affecting other parts of what we might think of as social policy areas. Uh, the My School website, is essentially a phenomenon to enable and empower consumers, in this case parents, and depending on the family of their kids, to make more informed choices about the schools that they might like to go to. Um, in Victoria, there have been substantial reforms in vocational education and training, which have all been about providing more power to consumers. And I think you'll see a similar level of reform here in Queensland over the coming years. And so the first theme I would put to you is that there's a consumer revolution going on. And even if you say to yourself, but we've always been consumer-centred, I'd ask you to just test that question of you again, yourself again, because um, many community organisations I talk to, and perhaps as relevantly, many ministers and senior public servants would say, we have enormous admiration for the community sector, but we're not convinced they're always consumer-centred. We think sometimes they have um, are captured by their own sense of what they're trying to be, and sometimes um, think other about the consumer in a different way than the consumer would think about it. So theme number one. Theme number two uh, um, is the dollars. The fiscal position of Australian governments is troubled. It is difficult, and it's not it would appear a fleeting phenomenon. It's not that we'll see the last part of the last three to four years and the next year or two, was, that was the dip and we came back pretty strongly. Um, there are a number of reasons for that. One, we did, we have accumulated and will continue, it would seem, to accumulate a fair bit of public debt over the last five years. More importantly, um, perhaps we'll grow with Asia, as we have through the resources boom, perhaps we won't. But the other thing that most people are not aware of is 2011 was the peak proportion of population of working age in Australia. 
Now, what I mean by that is, before that, we had lots of young, young Australians, kids who we were supporting and educating. Um, now we've moved to the situation, there was in this period where the baby boom in a century was peak working age, so we're generating enormous amount of income and wealth and hence taxes, et cetera, et cetera. But now we've moved to a situation, yes, we don't have many kids, but increasingly the baby boom's moving into retirement phase where we'll need to support them, and that will have a fiscal demand. So it's a little bit less likely that we'll have very healthy surpluses in the future than we've had through the period from 2000 to 2010. And that means that governments will increasingly be cautious about how they spend their money, and that will, of course, have implications for funding for the work that you all do. Number three, the governments themselves are starting to ask tough questions of themselves. Um, and it really comes in two forms. Firstly, they're very seriously asking themselves, are they well placed to deliver the services, or are they better placed to collaborate? And as Karen said, Collaboration is something this sector does extremely well and indeed has always done, not just with each other but with government and with other providers. And so you will hear the term, and I imagine you've been hearing here, the terms like contestability, commissioning, collaboration. They will be terms that will come through again and again and again. And in using those terms, governments are both saying we'd like to collaborate with you around the way we design the service system, so you get a chance to input into the policy end, and also we'd like to collaborate with you, which typically means we'd like you to do most of the heavy lifting in terms of service delivery. And we'll pay you for that, but we'll probably pay you for it through the consumer rather than directly to you, hence theme number one. But the other thing that's coming through is governments are increasingly saying we're not convinced our programs work as a collection of programs. Yes, indivi every individual program looks like a great program, but when you put them all together, you say we've created a schmozzle and it's not working in the interest of individual consumers, their carers, their families, their communities. And so that's why we've, you increasingly hear talking about place-based support and place-based care because we recognise that people live in place. Um, in Victoria at the moment, and, and in WA, but you've got some speakers on WA later, so I won't cover that space, but in Victoria at the moment, there's a revolution in, what, in the Department of Human Services where they're essentially saying programs no longer have power, areas have power. And areas will decide how the money is allocated to providers such as yourself to meet the needs of consumers. And we're not interested in specialists, we're interested in workers who can meet the integrated needs, the holistic needs of the uh, client rather than the very specific program needs. Um, so it's occurring in two ways. It's occurring in terms of real rethinking from governments about um, their role and secondly, real rethinking about the way that their programs work or don't. Now, some of it I, would, some of it I think is ideological and the fact that we now have coalition governments in all the major states um, and perhaps we'll have in Tasmania and South Australia in the coming year or two if the polls to be believed, means that some of these themes may be ideological, uh, but I think others would argue that it probably won't turn back. It, will, it may change over the next five to ten years, but it will probably remain that way. Fourth big move, the private sector. The private sector is likely to become interested if the market grows. The private sector is very good at sniffing out opportunity and um, the demand for services from people in Australia will likely to increase, partly due to booming, uh, baby boom moving through and partly due to other effects and the private sector may choose to play. Now, um, where have you seen this before? In health, the private sector started to move in about two decades ago, three decades ago and so you started with main health which was a terrible mess but it's now turned into health scope. You have Ramsey, you have a series of private providers who are growing more rapidly than the sector as a whole and becoming more important players and are, and are really challenging the, the um, religiously based private health providers. So health is an area where we've seen that. Um, in aged care, increasingly the private sector has moved in. Even in your areas, you can see the private sector playing in small ways. The experiment or trial being run in New South Wales around social investment bonds is essentially a collaboration between private sector and not-for-profit provider and government. And the private sector is looking at that both from a, there is some altruism there, but they're also looking for return on their investment. So it's, it's likely that you'll see over the coming, I think, 10 years, I don't think this is a, a rapid phenomenon, but over the longer term, you'll, you may well see more input from the private sector. Um, fifth, 
the workforce, um, and I'm sure all of you have thought about this, we may have trouble finding them, but we may also have an explosion in volunteering. And I would suspect your sector is far better placed to tap volunteers than most. And so there'll be an interesting challenge over the coming years is how do you manage um, a very tight labour market from a sort of those who will be paid, but perhaps a growing and very interested volunteering market. And finally, I think there's a sleeper. If I look at most sectors and most industries, technology has been an enormous contributor to outcomes for customers, to um, performance and to cost efficiency, and it's not much yet touched your sector. But it is the case that there are people out there who are technophiles, who like technology, who are thinking, is there something I could be doing? And they're thinking, let me say, they're thinking both from a sort of private sector opportunity perspective, but they're also, is there some good stuff I could be doing by using technology in new ways? And so I think that's a, that's a, a sleeper for this sector as to how you might use technology. What does this mean for the community sector? Um, It certainly means, rather obviously, that you'll need to think increasingly about the way you provide services to clients and how effective you are. Now, let me give an example. We have a client who is a mission-based organisation. Um, I have an enormous amount of respect for the work they do, the culture they have, the values they bring to the task. And when I ask them, is your client service better than others, most of them will say yes. And then when you look at the customer, serve, customer satisfaction data, they're in the third quartile for customer satisfaction. That is, they're not in the top 25%, they're not in the not next 25%, they're in the 25% below that. They are better than the last 25%, but... And they were presented with this data in a, in a forum like this. And then they were asked, are we, is our client service, is our client satisfaction very good? And they said, yes. Despite having the evidence presented to them, they still had this view that we provide very good client service. What was happening there? What I think was happening was a cultural reinforcement that because they're doing good work, of course they're providing great client service. But in fact, although their ethos was to provide great, great client service, their operational and processes didn't help them provide great client service at all. Um, so for the community sector, I think there is going to be a real emphasis on are we really providing great client service or are we telling ourselves, because that's part of our ethos, part of our culture, that we're providing great client service. And governments will fund on this basis increasingly. They will look at what's the customer satisfaction and customer outcome data telling us, therefore, in a contestable market, who should we provide more funding to and who not. The second thing that I'd say with respect to client service, and comes in this point, client change, I do wonder, Mark, whether QCOS should be called QCOST, which would be the Queensland Council of Social Transformation. And when I say social transformation, I don't mean social engineering of our society. We'll leave that to governments. What I mean is thinking both about what are the services we provide, but how do we help change the life circumstances of our clients, so they're clients of ours for a short period of time, or if their need is such that they will need an ongoing service, we're providing that service in a way that gets them into the community, whether it's into jobs or other activity, more so than is currently the case. And governments, at least as funders, will increasingly emphasise transformation change capability building as much as they'll emphasise service. So. Um, I'm sure you won't change the name of QCOS, but I would ask you to think about should we be QCOS rather than QCOS. Um, secondly, there will be enormous amount of opportunity in this coming world. Not necessarily for more money, and I'm sure the Queensland Government will, every time you say we think, they'll say yes, but there's no more money. But there's opportunity for big ideas. Governments at the moment, and certainly the new governments that have come in, are looking at the problem saying, and they won't say this publicly, but privately they'd say, we've not solved this over the last 10 or 20 years. It's not because the Labor governments didn't do a good job. It wasn't because the coalition governments didn't do a good job. It's because we're not sure we've taken the right approach. 
And so if you can come with exciting new ideas, which is not to say that the data government do this on a grand scale, but you might say, let's do it on a small scale and see what we can trial and get proved up. I think there'll be a lot of um, room for opportunities. And we are seeing that in other states where people are coming with good ideas and um, they're getting at least a bit of interest from the minister. Thirdly, there will be demand growth, but there'll probably not be price growth. There'll prob probably be price pressure. So there'll be an increasing emphasis from government to say, yes, we're prepared to give you more funding, but only if you can do a lot more with the funding than you've done historically. Fourth, um, there will be competition of a sort. And I know Karen made the point of we'll have to rethink, we'll have to think about how we respond to competition or how we reframe competition. The way governments are calling it across the country is this term contestability, which is a term we've imported from the UK. And contestability is both contestability of policy, that is, how do we go about providing service systems that work best for clients and enable them to transform their lives, but also contestability in terms of um, service provision, and in that sense contestability does mean um, the government and other funders will be saying is provider A better place than provider B, or is provider C and D and E combined, because they've come with a joint offer, more, um, more compelling, more able to achieve the outcomes we want to achieve than provider A and B. Um, I think both scale and niches can win. And I know sometimes there is consultants such as I will say, it's a, um, this is all going to be scale that wins it or it's going to be the niche. I think it will, it's lots of both. There will certainly be opportunities for very large um, providers who can demonstrate that they are both responsive and efficient. And the efficiency will be highly regarded. But there will also be lots of opportunity for niche providers to do something very distinctive and special for a particular community or for a particular group of Queenslanders. I've made the point about the workforce is likely to change substantially. And I think um, one of the great advantages you have is you can access a highly skilled, low cost workforce called volunteers. But the challenge will be, can you organise them in a way which means you are leveraging their expertise and the fact that they want to make a contribution and don't need to be paid um, in a way that generates better outcomes for clients at lower cost, or is it just going to create more confusion in your organisation and lack of accountability? And finally, um, there will be a real emphasis on performance and efficiency. Um, and demonstration from you that you are a high performing organisation and efficient, not just that you believe you are, but the data tells you that you are. And that you can demonstrate the data and you track the data and you measure yourself against the data in a way that demonstrates your performance. You, you are both high performing and very efficient. Now, if they're the pressures on the sector, how should you respond? The first point I would make is never, ever give up your mission. When we work with the private sector, they'll often talk about values and a sense of mission. And I think to myself, I never say this, but I think to myself, you have no idea what mission is until you've worked with a community sector organisation that has a genuine sense of wanting to contribute to their communities, wanting to contribute to the people in their communities. And it comes through very clearly in the religiously based um, community organisations because they'll talk about the healing mission of Christ or in other forms like that where the language is quite distinctive. But it's obviously just as strong in the, um, sector, sec, um, the secular community-based organisations as well. And other organisations will look at your sense of mission with great envy. So in, in everything I'm subsequently going to say about more pressure on performance and the like, remember that the cultural dimension of mission is absolutely essential both to the value that you provide to your communities, um, but also to, to be honest, to your competitive advantage. Your mission is a competitive advantage as well as an intrinsic and essential part of who you are. Um, I think you'll need, you will need to think about clients and you will need to be very careful, I think, about how you think of service delivery. I was talking to a client yesterday in, the, in a community sector organisation. He said, I am very nervous about the term delivery. I said, service delivery, it's a great term. It sort of has this sense of 
providing something people want. And he said, yes, but every time we say service delivery, we think we know what service needs to be delivered. And we don't metaphorically get ourselves around the side of the client and say, do they need any of our services? Or do they need something quite different in order to transform their life outcomes? And, and so with clients, it's very, very tempting for you to see their need in terms of your service. If something's an, if you've got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If you're a disability provider that provides a certain set of services, all their needs start to look like your services. And, and it takes a genuine act of um, intellectual discipline and imagination to think, what is it that they want? And do we provide that or should we have someone else provide it? And I would note that government is, has a healthy scepticism of your capacity to think beyond your service mix. So they would typically say, yes, you're good at collaborating, but you're even better at finding um, that clients need your services. So one point of the response is you re really will need to think about what are the outcomes that need to be achieved and where do our services fit and where would we look somewhere else? Um, thirdly, I think you'll need, in other states, there's quite a lot of thinking going on about do we have a performance mindset or is our sense of mission acting against our performance mindset? Now, how could that be? Many community sector organisations in other states are now saying our mission is a critical, it's an essential part of who we are as per point one. But what it does is it keeps telling us that we're good already, and that we don't need to change, and that we're intrinsically a high-performing organisation and we don't need to measure that. And so they're saying we have quite a challenging cultural um, situation ahead of us because we want to retain our mission, mission, but we have to think about how do we introduce a stronger sense of performance so we can demonstrate that to others. And that will mean we'll need to think about efficiency. A client that we've worked with in another state has spent the last six months reorganising themselves, and this will seem odd, reorganising themselves from a place-based way of providing their service around areas to a business line way of offering their service. And you say, that's got to be the wrong way around. And in fact, that's at odds with what I was saying I was saying earlier on. But what they've said, what their senior executive has said is, if we're place-based, we're pretty middling at everything. We're sort of good, but we're not great. And in the sector we're in, it's becoming clear that the government is going to fund the very efficient providers. And we can only become very efficient if we organise ourselves in business line and then make the connections across the business lines. So they've thought a lot about in terms of the process of service delivery, how do they make that as efficient as possible? The second thing they've been thinking about, and this is some interesting work I think NAUS has done across the nation, is we've benchmarked the back office functions of not-for-profit providers. We've done that in Victoria, New South Wales, Western Australia, South Australia, and I think we are talking with some people here in Queensland. Uh, but just to give you uh, early warning, if your back office functions, I'm told, are more than 11% of your funding, you're a relatively high back office function. If it's lower than that, you're efficient. And do you know? I suspect many of you might not, because it's not something we've thought about. But, uh, and the 11% may not be critical, but what's actually coming out of that is providers are now starting to say, should we share our back office with other providers? Are there things that we can do that will make us substantially more efficient than we are at the moment, because they're costs that are not getting funds to clients? And so, and they don't think about it, this is about cost reduction, they think about it, this is about maximising the amount of service we can provide to clients. Fourthly, I think service providers may have to think more about what's the surplus they're generating, not to make a profit to give to someone, but to be able to reinvest, to grow, to assume risk. And let me give you an example of a client we were working with in Victoria who made a break-even position every year in cash terms. So what they had come in, they spent in delivering services to their clients. And every year their asset base, their capital, their buildings, their equipment, etc., etc., would get that little bit worse. But because they were breaking even every year, they thought they were fine. We pointed out to them that in three years' time they are going to have to renew quite a bit of their capital stock. And did they have any money to do it? Now they didn't have any money to do it because they'd never taken the view, we need to generate a surplus to be able to reinvest. Now you might say, well that's just an accounting problem, they should have done their accounting more effectively. 
I'd say they also hadn't been thinking about our service will change in the coming years and we need a little bit of buffer in order to help make that change. Our service may become enabled by technology more in the future and we need a little bit of money in order to invest in the next technology. And I know in the community sector, quite rightly, your views always, we've got to provide as much service as we possibly can. But in this world that's emerging, I put to you that you'll need to think about how are we going to transform our service and our organisation and do we have any capacity to do that? Um, six, I think you should think a lot more about partnerships um, and sometimes with odd bedfellows and sometimes with very obvious ones. There's a regional city in another state, a little bit like Toowoomba, but not Toowoomba. Um, where it has two providers of essentially the same services, one of which has a very large number of clients, but not much cash. Another one has a smaller number of clients and due to good fortune over the hi historical years, has a large amount of money. It was left a, a valuable building which it subsequently sold. You would think those organisations might get together and share the money and the service delivery in order to deliver better. You can imagine how difficult that is. They both have a deep sense of history of who they are, and so the capacity to provide a partnership in order to better meet the needs of clients is a real challenge for them. Um, but unusual bedfellows, if you look at the social investment bonds in New South Wales, which is a trial that's being run, um, initiated by Social Ventures Australia, it's essentially a partnership between a, a um, very hard-driving investment bank a not-for-profit provider and a government. And it's essentially said to the government, we will take the risk that will improve the, government, the, the outcomes for our clients. And if we're successful, we'll financially benefit. And if we're not successful, we'll lose substantial amounts of money, but you, the government, will not be exposed at all. Now, the government was very interested in that for obvious reasons. One, they were very interested to see if they could achieve better outcomes. And, and secondly, they were delighted the fact they weren't taking any fiscal risk. Now, those sorts of unusual partnerships, whether it's that particular model or whether it's other models, I think your government, as, as much as other governments in Australia, will be intrigued by those sorts of opportunities. Um, and finally, in terms of how you should respond, I think there will be a degree of cultural courage and, and leadership of organisations to recognise the realities of what is coming and being prepared to respond to them. And being res prepared to respond to them in a way which is respectful of your past and respectful of your staff, but more importantly, most respectful of the needs of your clients and how you need to change their life outcomes and hence how that means you will need to change as an organisation. Let me, there's one more I'd like to cover, which is, and for government. Because in the changes that I've outlined that I'm seeing in other states, the government is saying we want to achieve these things and then is not always delivering on its promise. And so I, I don't know if there are people from government in the audience. I assume there's a, a small number at least. Good to see you. Um, and, but I also put this out there for you in the community sector to be able to say to government, this isn't just about us changing, this isn't just about us responding, it's also about how you're prepared to work with us. Um, and so firstly, I think for government, there is the need for some fundamental rethinking across domains. Can we get the people in community services, human services, to talk to the people in education? Can we get the people in community services to talk to the people in employment services? Can we get the state government to talk to the Commonwealth government? Why are we the ones that are having to stitch this all together when they're coming at us with this program and that program and that program and that program and because it's driving an enormous amount of red tape for you in having to do all the reporting for all these different programs and not delivering a better outcome for clients at all. So I think there's a fundamental rethink required across government. And in fact, I wonder whether there's not some sort of, at the com with the new Commonwealth government, whether there shouldn't be something like a white paper or another process which says, how will we think about welfare, community services, employment, better life outcomes in an integrated way, rather than thinking about homelessness as one issue, unemployment as another issue, disability as another issue. How would we completely rethink that model so that we start afresh? Secondly, and I think this might be the most important one for government, they will need to think leadership, not control. And this is true both for ministers and for public servants. 
Now, ministers say quite reasonably, I'd say, but we're always providing leadership, and indeed they are. They do provide political leadership. But what's required here is they're prepared to say, here's what we want to achieve, and here's, we want to work on it in a collaborative way, but we recognise not everything will work, and when something goes wrong, we'll say, we're not surprised it went wrong, but many things have gone right, and we're still working on it. <coughs> and that will be even more important for public servants who um, have an ingoing um, assumption, which is correct in a way, they're responsible for taxpayers' money and they want to see it spent well. But that doesn't mean that they should be tracking every dollar in a very detailed way, nor that they should be setting every process in the same way. If they are, they, what they need to say is, we're interested in outcomes and we recognise there will be some risk in this and we're thinking about this from a leadership perspective, not a control perspective. It will be a huge challenge for governments to take this on and I would, um, I would give you the courage to take on the ministers and the director generals and the deputy director generals and others in order to engage in a discussion of this isn't just about us, it's about you as well. Um, governments will think a lot about contestability commissioning, which is the new word for how will they design the services they want and then um, fund those services or purchase those services, and they will think a lot about collaboration. There's a major project going on in New South Wales at the moment, one of the Premier's three top projects. He's got one around productivity, one around public administration, and one around collaboration. They're the three projects he's working on for how he wants the New South Wales public service to change. And the project around collaboration is essentially a project which says, how do we profoundly change the way we go about government so that we work productively with the community sector and the private sector and others? And by the way, they don't care in New South Wales whether it's the community sector providing or the private sector. They're interested in performance and outcomes for clients. So you won't have a privileged place at the table. At least you wouldn't in New South Wales. Um, fourthly, for government, it's really important, I think, that people in government remember you're not the solution. The more you think you are the solution, the more problematic you might become. Um, and if you're the Commonwealth government, I'd say it's even more the case. You're not the solution. You need to work with states and communities. But you need to be part of the solution. And if you're part of the solution, then that means you give power away and work collaboratively with others. Um, fifthly, I'd say you need to be the client, not the program. Faxia has doubled in size in the last 15 years in terms of numbers of public servants. Um, now, partly that has been to, due to the um, attempts to address Indigenous disadvantage in the Northern Territory, but largely it's also been due to an enormous growth in the number of programs. And every program, as I said, has had good intent, but collectively we've generated an enormous number of people administrating programs, but it's not clear we've achieved better outcomes. Sixth, government will need to think about coordination. Um, coordination across government, education, health, human services, etc. And finally, and this is perhaps the major challenge for government in addition to leadership, not control, is working collaboratively reduces the risk of poor outcomes because you're tapping into the knowledge and expertise of many others. Um, so the approach that's being proposed to take in is many respects a risk reduction approach, but you'll still be accountable, obviously, and you'll need to re we'll need to rethink what's the nature of accountability for the funding that we do. So in conclusion, it's, it, this is an exciting era from you, but it's one of those exciting eras where if your mission is strong, and your performance is as strong as your mission, I think there's enormous opportunity for you to better meet the needs of Queenslanders and in other parts of Australia to better meet the needs of Australians. If, on the other hand, your mission is strong and your performance is not equally strong, it will be a somewhat scary era. Um, we should see a step change in outcomes for disadvantaged Australians. I know that you've all been working for years at achieving a step change for disadvantaged Australians and their communities. But you will need to have the courage to grab the opportunities and be prepared to fail and pick yourself up and go again. As someone said to me yesterday, our ethos has always been we'll fail our way to success. And perhaps that's an appropriate place for me to finish. <laughs>